Aldous Huxley was an English writer and philosopher. He wrote nearly 50 books. And here's his quote about history. That men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all the lessons of history. Welcome to the History Slices Podcast. A mother-son duo discussing awesome bits of history. We prove on every show that history is not boring. Entertaining, yet stimulating. This is History Slices. And now, here's your hosts, Jacob and Rachel. Well, hello, Julia. Hi, Mom. So I just want to um, let people know that this is Julia, one of Jacob's sisters, and she has agreed to come in and teach us a little bit about a topic of her choice, which I'm going to let her introduce in a moment. But I just wanted to um, tell you, thank you, Julia, for taking time to be with us today, for taking time to uh, do the research and prepare. I'm excited and looking forward to hearing about what you've got to teach us. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks to the people aforementioned um, <laughs> who will be listening to me drone on about something that I am passionate about. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the best thing to talk about, honestly, something you're passionate about. And, you know, not everybody's going to like the same thing. So, <laughs> you know, you might just strike a chord with some people who, who, you know, we haven't yet. That's the hope. Yeah, there you go. All right. So how, where do we begin? Well, tell us what it is first. What's the topic? Well, um, so. I think it's really important that in talking about history, we also talk about linguistic history, um, which is something that I'm very interested in and is also very affected by basically any part of history ever. (laughs) Um, Everything affects languages um, by like migration patterns to whether a language is written down or not to invasions, um, and everything else. So um, what we're going to actually specifically be talking about is the English language, um, because I absolutely love that topic more than any other, probably, (laughs) because of the English language. Um, I ate up an entire textbook um, my last semester of college, just trying to learn every single thing uh, about the history of the English language that I could. Um, So obviously, since we're talking about like language and stuff. I, I know this really cerebral, so I'm I'm focusing on a specific point in time, which was the Norman invasion, um, which happened in 1066. Okay. So, um, do you want me to keep talking? I'm writing down 1066. That's a time period like that's before most of what Jacob and I tend to talk about. So I was realizing that I was like, you know, I think this is like one of the earliest things that has been talked about, but it's still history and it's totally relatively recent history if you think about it. Well, so, the um, older I get, the faster time goes. I realize it's not, you know, things aren't as long ago as, as it I seems. Know. I was thinking about that too. I'm like, the 20s were 100 years ago. <laughs> so if you just multiply that by like 10 like I, we're all the way to 1066 so <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy um, well I'm excited to learn because I, I really don't you know I only remember what I learned in school about the Norman invasion and of course I have a serious interest in the English language too so I'm excited to see where this goes yeah and I honestly I feel like the Norman invasion, I don't know how it's taught without talking about its effect on English language. Um, because just because that's like the majority of how I learned about it, just most recently, at least, and it just is so integral to it. So yeah, I, I guess I can just start off from the beginning. Yeah, um, sounds so, good. Yeah. So um, the Norman invasion specifically was, you know, of England. Um, So it was the Normans of Normandy invading England. And England is like a highly sought after piece of land, um, which is evidenced by how many castles are like just peppered throughout it. Yeah. Um, Which is something I learned when I was studying in Wales, actually. Um, But uh, and when you're talking Celts, about England, you're talking about yes. the British Isles, like all of... I No, no, no. no I'm talking specifically just about England. England. Okay. Yes. So the Celts settled in England as far back as the Bronze Age. Um, there were multiple invasions by Rome. One, once Julius Caesar tried to invade it in like 54, 55 BC. And then later Claudius invaded it and was more successful in 43 AD. Um, and then the Scots and the Picts, um, they lived in Scotland. Um, and then they kind of 
started more invading from the north once the Roman forces had retreated in 410. So it's like all of this, like all these people constantly in and out of England. Interesting. Um, but um, for different accounts as to like how or why, whether um, they were like invited or they were retreating from elsewhere, um, the Germanic tribes settled, which and Germanic tribes are something you, I don't know if a lot of people know about. They were the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, and the Frisians. I'm sorry, um, the Angles, the Saxons, the what? It's actually Angles, not well, Angles. A- Angles. Yeah, like A N G L E S. Okay. Um, and the Saxons and the Jutes. J U T E S. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then the Frisians. Um, and they came from the Danish peninsula and like where modern day Germany and Holland are. Um, and so that's kind of the area that those people came over and they were Germanic tribes. They were speaking an old Germanic like dialect. And that came and then more tribes came over the next hundred years. And eventually um that settled into four kingdoms that kind of they kind of consolidated. Okay, so let me have, let me quick clarify yeah. here. So the four Germanic tribes somehow they they were in England and eventually became these four kingdoms. Yes. I'm guessing an Angle kingdom, a Saxon kingdom, Jute and Frisian kingdom, all in England. Um, yes. Interestingly, okay. they aren't entirely lined up with the tribes just because it was an eventual thing. Okay, and they had had smaller kingdoms, but okay. one of them. I mean, it's pretty obvious that at least two of them are. I mean, the Angles and the Saxons, which, you know, they're called the Anglo-Saxons, you know? Yeah. Um, so they obviously have a little bit more of a presence. Okay. One of them, Wessex, um, which is clearly like West Saxons when you think about like where that probably came from. Yeah. Wessex, East Anglia, Mercia, and Northumbria. And so it, what it looks like is if you were going clockwise – from the top of England, it would be like Northumbria and then East Anglia, Mercia, or sorry, Wessex and Mercia. So like, here, I'll repeat that. So if you're going clockwise from the top of England, it would be Northumbria and then East Anglia, where like London is, Wessex, and then Mercia, Okay, closer to Wales. I think what's important about that is you have a lot of things that come up later that require knowledge to know just how big England is at this point, like kind of what it looks like. Okay. Um, and yeah. Okay. And, and what, <laughs> anyway. Can you remind me like what kind of era are we talking about right here? Because you talked about, you mentioned a few different mm-hmm. ages. So I think the last one you men- mentioned was like 43 AD when Claudius went in there, but the Norman invasion well, was. Also the Romans retreated in 410. Okay. And so the Scots and Picts oh, then had a little bit more of a presence there. Okay. And by some accounts, old, 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 old accounts, um, <laughs> they said that the Germanic tribes were actually invited to England to try and push out the Scots and Picts. Oh. Um, but uh, that's not as likely as the fact that they were probably just retreating from their homelands because of overpopulation. Interesting. But, yes, very even after the kingdoms had gotten there, even after that, there was a Holy Roman Empire coming who like were trying to Christianize England. And then also the Scandinavians in the late 700s and 800s, which actually resulted in half of England being controlled by the Danes. Wow. Um, and it was it was a line kind of like how the Mason-Dixon line is just a drawn line. Uh-huh. Um, this one was a line just going northwest from the Thames called the Dane Law, um, wow. <laughs> which is really interesting so like half of england was kind of controlled by the danes for a bit after the 800s and into the 900s which we will get to so this all does have to do with the norman invasion it may not seem like it but it is important um to know first of all that england has always been something that's a tactical advantage and that people have wanted Mm -hmm. um and second of all who's at play here So we see a lot of Romans, Germanic, and Scandinavians. And next (laughs) would be the Norman invasion. Um, And many things have affected the language of, like, England. (laughs) But probably the most notable and what caused the most change was the Norman invasion. And it, like, literally 
marks the beginning of the stage of the language that's called Middle English, um, which was approximately 1100 to 1500. So the state of England um, in 1066 was a little bit chaotic. So I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory. The King of England until January 4th, because he died, um, his name was Edward, and he was the son of Ethelred and Emma of Normandy. So that marriage was actually like completely tactical, made by the Duke of Normandy, um, who was Emma's father. Um, so what we're talking about is the parents of the the King of England at the start of 1066. Okay. And he was trying to create alliances with England in order to strengthen Normandy. So Emma's marriage to King Edward's father was completely tactical. And after his father died, um, his mother actually married the King of Denmark, who had control over that Danish part of England. And his name was Canute, <laughs> which is funny, but their <laughs> child's name. So um, <laughs> Edward's mother, Emma, and King Canute had a son named Hartha Canute. So um, if it doesn't get more Scandinavian than that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly, King Edward, when he was just 11, the Danes were invading, like, you know, Obviously, they're right next to each other on this tiny island. There's going to be a lot of like, you know, skirmishes. Are you skirmishes? Yeah. So the Danes tried to invade for a year. So they went to Normandy, but then came back for a year. And then well, literally only a couple of years later, Edward's dad died, even though he had literally just been reinstated as king. And so Edward was like, OK, I'm going to be gone now. He was like pushed out of England yet again back to Normandy. So he spent a good chunk of his early years because he was born in 1002 and didn't return to England until 1042. Wow. So he was 11 when he first went there. So he spent at least like 25 years in Normandy, which is a hugely important thing to think about because, and this is something that I've learned too, because I've been researching the history of like the Norman invasion and kind of like why it was a thing. And it's really just interesting to look at this and see all of the sides and feel like there's really nobody who is right here. Like, I can see how everything kind of got mixed up and the reason there's a Norman invasion. So what happened with, with Canute was when he, like, invaded and he married Emma um, because she was <laughs> the recently widowed wife of the king so obviously that is a great way a great in and it was complete political strategy at first although it became affectionate later which i love that um <laughs> just for the story of yes, it yes. um and their child hartha canute he took over once canute died but then hartha canute died as well without having any heirs Okay, so I, point, I got mixed up somewhere. I am trying to keep up, but I, I got lost. I'm so, so sorry. No, that's okay. Like... There's just so much um, kind of back and forth, and you're doing a good job telling it, yeah. but I'm it's all new to me, so I'm trying to keep up. So, And okay. maybe our listeners um, would appreciate just a, just a quick summary. So there was, yeah. let's see if I can re redo this. You correct me if I'm wrong. So there was Emma, who was married to the English king, who mm -hmm. the, she became a widow, so the king died, and she married Canute, who was a... Dane. Yes. And Canute and she had a child named Hartha Canute, <laughs> who yes. also was, or no, he didn't become king. He did. He did become king. And then once Canute died, once Canute died, he became king. So where does, where does King Edward fit into this? Well, Edward is still in Normandy at this point. Was it who During was, both Canute and Hartha Canute's reigns. But who does Edward he belong is in to? Like Normandy. Do we know his parents or he's just King yeah, Edward? No, well, he's Emma and Ethelred. Ah, son. so he's sort of a half brother to Hartha Canute. He's entirely a half brother. Okay, to I got yes. Ethelred. Okay, that's the part that I got a little bit confused. So King Edward, Hartha Canute, half siblings. And Hartha yes. Canute is the king of England. Mm -hmm. But so is King Edward. So, but he's well, in... Hartha Canute, once Hartha Canute dies, then Edward comes back and reclaims the throne. Okay. Because he's in exile in Normandy at this point. Thank you so much for taking a second to explain that uh, to me. Of I course. feel much better going forward. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I feel like it almost would be more beneficial to, like, just take out some of the confusion earlier and just put in, like, your little summary there and what happened (laughs) there. Um, That was great. Um, Okay. (laughs) Obviously, yes, um, once Edward came back and reclaimed his throne, he very much favored the Normans because he spent most of his life in Normandy. And also, I don't know if people know this, but Normandy is in France. Um, That's just an important thing to mention. I probably wouldn't have known that before. So it's it's like just right across the English Channel. Yeah. So it's just, is that just like the northern uh, province of France or something or? One of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I'll I'll talk a little bit more about the history of Normandy um, soon. But it's just right across the channel. So they're really close. So because he favored Norman so much, Edward, once he became king, he like brought Normans with him. Um, And his father-in-law, who was the Earl of Wessex, which if you remember, was one of the four kingdoms Uh in the larger country of England. Um, Or like not really a kingdom. It was probably more of just a region at this point because it was all one thing, one kingdom all controlled it, i guess it was an earl ship or whatever those are called earldom, uh, earldom? <laughs> I don't know. sure sure so he was the earl of wessex and he his name was godwin edward's father-in-law and he very much did not approve of the normans um along with the earl of mercia i believe too um it was just absolutely not what is this why are you doing like we are english we are not yeah. <laughs> so Godwin, purely English, but he was also, he was Edward's wife's dad. Okay. Yeah. And so he actually ended up being kind of the one in charge for the first 11 years of Edward's reign um, because Edward was like, he was pretty chill. And I think Godwin was kind of just really wanting to assert as much power as possible just to try and make sure that the Normans stayed out of it Uh but um Edward and Godwin did have kind of a falling out and Godwin was um like exiled basically until (laughs) yeah the thing is Edward's favoritism was continuing to cause problems with other people like Godwin wasn't the only one so he was like all right no civil war let's bring Godwin back and then exile a lot of people that he liked from Normandy Huh. So, because that was like the best, like politically tactical advantage, because you can't, you just, you can't have that many people from a different country. Yeah. <laughs> wow. In okay. Places of importance. So he exiled um, people out of Normandy. You mean you're talking about um, Edward brought people out of Normandy into England? Yes. Okay. When, like people who were his favorites, who right. were like around him all the time. Okay. Probably in like nobles and stuff like that. And he brought him um, to England proper. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, so when Godwin, the Earl of Wessex, when he died, his son Harold took over Wessex and then also was able to do a lot for England. Um, he subjugated Wales in 1063 and negotiated with rebellious Northumbrians in 1065. He was very much like almost, it seems like sort of an ambassador for the king, but also uh, an advisor. Hmm. Um, to King and- Edward? To King Edward, yeah. Okay. Um, and so Edward actually named Harold, who is now the Earl of Wessex, his successor, <laughs> shortly before the former's death. So before Edward's death, he named Harold his successor. And if we remember from the beginning of this, Edward died January of 1066. So at that time, Harold became king. But this was heavily challenged, like heavily challenged. First of all, Haley's Comet (laughs) came. (laughs) Um, It was either, so there were a couple of reports that I saw. It was either the 14th day before the Calends of May or the seventh day of the Calends of May. Um, And for those of you who don't know, because you aren't cool like me, Calends in the the Roman calendar is just the beginning of the month. So, And are you um, saying Calend, like C-A-L-E-N? It's K A L E N D S. Okay. I must say, I know that from Percy Jackson. <laughs> so it was either the middle of April or the beginning of May when Haley's Comet flew by. Um, so only a few months after Harold had become king, and Haley's Comet was very much considered a bad omen. Ah. Um, yeah. Which, I mean, <laughs> is pretty much evidenced by the way the rest of 1066 went um, because <laughs> Hardrada 
um, also na- known as Harold, but oh, spelled funny. in a different name, which is funny. So we're going to call him Hardrada because that's less confusing. Um, it's less confusing than Harold? Because his name is also Harold. Um, oh, it's a different the person. His name is Harold. Yes. Another person. Another named person. Hardrada. Hardrada. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was the king of Normandy at the time. Huh. Um, and he actually believed the throne was his. Which sounds confusing because you're like, where does Norway fit into this, right? We're talking about the Danes. We're talking about the Normans. What about Norway? Like, where are the Norwegians in this story? Well, um, his father, Magnus, and Hartha Knut, who, as we recall, was the king back before Edward, they had made an agreement that if one of those two kings, Magnus or Hartha Knut, should die childless, the other would get his lands. Wow. Um, and Hartha Canoe did die childless. So this way, at this point, Hardrada is like, okay, no, there, I, the kingdom is 100% mine by this point, you know? Um, so he decided to invade England at the Humber River, which is in the north. It's actually closer to Scotland than it is to London. It's, it's quite north. And he landed there and he, there was a battle, and he was killed and defeated on September 25th, 1066. Wow. And that was only the first invasion, because William, the Duke of Normandy, also invaded. Wow. <laughs> um, and so now we're going to take a step back, and we're going to look at Wait, the Normans. Wait, I'm so confused why the Normans were invading if Harold, who was appointed by basically a Norman, right? Sort of? Yeah, was based, appointed I mean, king. So why, why Norman by mother's blood? Right. So why is a duke of Normandy now trying to invade England? Let's let, let me explain. Okay. This is a great <laughs> question. Um, so Normandy um, was a region filled with people from Scandinavia. So the group was actually like the initial group of of Scandinavians who settled in Normandy. Um, they were led by somebody named Rollo or Rolfer. Um, <laughs> and they were actually bribed with Normandy, um, like as a region, the land and everything, um, so that they could defend France from other Vikings. Okay. And this was only like 150 years before 1066. It was about 9-11. But... They actually did assimilate very quickly into French culture. So within those 150 years, they took on the culture, they took on the language, they were French, wow. um, which is very interesting. Um, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. But um, Duke William of Normandy, which who was the one invading, he was actually the seventh Duke of Normandy in those 150 years, which is very surprising. But there was at least one Duke who literally was only a Duke for one year. So... <laughs> You know, <laughs> um, but this William, he was called the Conqueror or oh. the Great, or also he was called the Bastard, which is funny. Um, but I've he's... I've heard of William the Conqueror before, mm-hmm. but of course I could I could have told you nothing at all about it. I just recognize the name. <laughs> well, he was the one who led the Norman invasion, so I guess that's why. There you go. I guess that's why it probably is. Like I feel like that's a pretty common thing to learn about. Yeah. Um, but then, um, so William actually became a duke at age six, um, and he was a second cousin to King Edward, because as you recalled, he, King Edward was Norman by his mother's blood. Right. Um, and they had spent time together. Um, William and Edward had spent time together during Edward's exile, um, and actually was le- led to believe he would succeed the throne, uh. um, which I think is, it's so fun to imagine them as buddies. Just like goofing off in Normandy, <laughs> I, I don't know. And I just Edward really saying, fun. "Yeah, dude, I'll give you the throne if I go." Right, it's exactly. All yours. Like they probably like got drunk one night and just like, <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, nothing um, official. He was just under the impression it would be his. Yeah, he was under the impression, and that's completely up in the air. Like that's something that no source has like solid. No source that I've seen, at least, I can don't know, confirm um, it. Can confirm whether or not he actually, like, officially offered it to him before he offered it to Harold. So that's a little bit of backstory. I do have way too many, way, way, way too many little like family trees oh and my histories goodness. of people of 
England and Denmark and Normandy way too many involved. I, in I my, seriously like, feel like I need a visual family tree, a picture of a family tree and all the, yeah. the these guys go with those guys, but they also go with those guys. And <laughs> Especially with things like Emma marrying twice yeah. into two different oh like my gosh. nationalities, you know, yeah. like that's a huge and like, she, well, she's from France. She married an English king and then she married a Danish king. Yeah. So like. Like stuff like that is just so much easier to see visualized, um, which is why this is a little bit hard to like tell things where it takes place over a number of years. But thankfully, we're done with that part <laughs> um, because September 28th, 1066, William landed in southern England. And this is William the Conqueror. He landed in southern England at Pevensey. Yes, um, like Lucy Pevensey <laughs> and Peter Pevensey uh-huh, and Edmund Pevensey, in the Pevensey and all of them, all of them. Yes. Um, you know, of the Chronicles of Narnia, for those who don't know. But um, so this was, if you recall, three days after the Battle of Stamford Bridge, which was the one at the Humber River, three days after the Norwegians invaded. Okay, hold on just a second. I got to catch up. Okay, so three days after the the Norwegians invaded, that was very north, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, you so... landed very south. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's almost like when you're playing tennis, and I don't really play tennis, so I don't know. But like when you, um, never mind, that's not a good analogy because I don't even know the right vocabulary. <laughs> but you know, like you've got your opponent on one end of the court, and then you just lob a soft one and bring them all the way back up to the net. And then it's like really hard to react. But um, really quick before you go on, I just want to say that every, like the names that you're saying and, um, of the people and the places it's totally reminding me of this show that I watched uh with dad um and I didn't realize that maybe some of it was actually uh, historically I mean it wasn't a historic it wasn't like a documentary it was just a you know a entertainment a piece of entertainment and I'm forgetting the name of it but um it has to do with this whole time period and really I swear they use some of the same names um, in fact I'm gonna have to go back and check about of the people and I'm um, uh, the guy, the main guy's name is Utrid, in case any of our um, listeners know what I'm talking about. And um, he was like Danish and he was like a he was like a mixed blood between Danish and English, I believe, or or something or Saxon. He was Saxon and Danish. And I don't know this whole thing, but uh, it, down to the name Harold feels familiar. So um, anyway, I don't know if you don't sound like you're familiar with that at all. But no. I've been making that sort of semi connection. But anyway. that's cool. You have to tell me what that show is. Okay, so Harold was all the way up, way north, like in Northumbria. He was very far up there, and he he was like, "Well, crap, you know, gotta go run a marathon back down to Pevensey area." Of course. It wasn't all the way at Pevensey. It was actually Hastings, um, which was where the army that William was leading had gotten to. Um, And so they finally met in battle on October 14th um, because you're traveling down the entire (laughs) length of England with an army. You have very little support. You just went through an entire battle yourself. So, like, you have people that have died. Everybody's exhausted. And I have to travel all the way back down. Um, it's going to take a couple weeks. So, um, <laughs> yeah, the Battle of Hastings, which sounds very familiar, I'm sure. It does, yes. Um, mm-hmm. So that um, was a really bloody battle, and it ended up killing the earls of Mercia and Northumbria. Wow. And King Harold himself. So that is three territories that are just without leadership at wow. this point. Because obviously the king is going to be in East Anglia or London and, and stuff. So... Sorry, I'm I'm still processing. So the Earls of yeah. Mercia, Northumbria, and King Harold himself. And he was also, the, he had been the Earl of Wessex before too. Okay. So I'm not sure like where that leadership went. Um, but basically he destroyed England, um, like the English leaders. Um, and so William, William was the one that was in charge of, of the uh, armies that uh, defeated Mercia, yeah. Umbria, and Wessex or King Harold. Okay. Yes, and then um, William actually continued to pillage his way northeast until his army reached London. He was crowned king in Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day in 1066. Wow. So this year was just an absolute whirlwind. Like, Harold had a couple of months, of good months, of being king. And he was generally accepted by, like, the English, 
but the outsiders were like, oh, heck no, I deserve this. Yeah. I deserve this. Wow. And so that meant September was his death and two battles and his death. Wow. And then it was only a couple more months. And then they had a third king of the year. My goodness. Yeah. That is really eventful. Oh, my gosh. I know. And we think and things move fast in the Internet age. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, can you imagine the English in that year? They're like so much just suffering from whiplash. Like, who's what do we do? Who's our leader? What's going on? Because I mean, yeah, because also like news was not traveling via yeah. the internet. <laughs> By the oh time they gosh. got it, it was a history lesson, right? <laughs> so, um, William actually ended up replacing most of English nobility, um, with Normans, um, both like to reward them and to ensure loyalty to himself. Makes sense. So, um, Literally seven to eight years after the invasion, by 1072, 11 out of 12 earls um, were Norman French. Okay. Which is very impressive. Um, That's pretty amazing. That just shows, like, how, like, they were just spotted, but they were still ruling, like, the English. And I think that's such an interesting dynamic to imagine. Yeah. Um, And so many kings of England after this spent a lot of time on French soil and had French wives to maintain their Frenchness. And Mm. um, a marriage of Henry III and Eleanor of Provence eventually at one point actually gained the Normans control of much of France and brought a solid or like a second influx of French nobility. And this was like almost 200 years later, but it's also something to note. So like the French nobles were there and then they had the Norman dialect. So this is where we're starting in like language and how it's so connected. And then once Henry III and Eleanor of Provence married, another influx of French nobility came and they came from Paris, which has a central French dialect. So that's also very interesting. They have different like French dialects within the nobility. Right. Um, And because Norman French was very much seen as improper uh-huh. by people who spoke Central French, which is so hoity-toity Parisian thing to do, you know. Yeah. Uh, no offense to anybody listening. Yeah, to here, it, yeah, here <laughs> it was in the nobility, in the ranks of nobility. Exactly. Yeah. So because of that, though, like the new nobles had, were focusing more on like how to speak French versus the fact that there were people speaking English outside of it. And we're going to we're going to talk a little bit more about all of the general effects on the English language. Um, We're just kind of focusing now on like what happened after the invasion. Um, And so the Hundred Years War actually was something that happened. Um, (laughs) And this was this was um, between like the mid 1300s and the mid 1400s. Um, And it was actually a century that wasn't just at war between England and France, but it was also like an absolute insanely completely festering with unrest. Um, The Black Death occurred just over a decade after the start of it and wiped out much of the population, meaning that um, the English laborers were in much greater demand and held more political sway. So, like, if you recall, the French were in the nobility spot. Anybody who spoke English, they were the ones who were below. Okay. Um, But because of the Black Death wiping out, like, 40% of the population, they had so much more sway, and it was a lot more important to provide the English laborers with what they asked for because otherwise they weren't going to work Mm. and um, this actually um, also allowed for urban population to grow as well as a middle class um, which meant English started gaining prestige because initially like obviously when the French came there they they were they were pretty indifferent to English but it was very much like a that's the language of the slums kind of thing. Um, like, we don't speak that. That's beneath us. But as the English kept gaining, mm-hmm. like... Status. Just status, yeah, social power, the language itself did as well, which is why I think it's so important that, like, everything is entangled when it comes to language and history. So much. Um, yeah, <laughs> literally anything. Because, like, one thing, like, the Peasants' Revolt in 1381 is, like, a notable point in time where something happened that changed for society as a whole that probably helped give you know peasants and laborers more rights and more you know pay and stuff like that but because of that the English language was able to subsist more too Mm -hmm. you know so it's just like such an interesting thing to think about and so in the mid to late 14th century so 14th century aka the 1300s um, and if we recall the mid 
10 hundreds was when the invasion was. The use of the English as an official language became more widespread, and it was used in schooling, literature, and judicial hearings outside of the royal court. And the full restoration of the English language is believed to have been completed by the reign of Henry V, um, who was there from 1413 to 1422. Can you say so, that one more time? The full completion? Of full restoration. Restoration. Of the English language, bringing it back to where it should be. Meaning um, as like the main focal as language. The language of okay. England. It's interesting that you can actually like, was that because Henry V made put policies in place or like how how do we pin it to him do you know um i i i could not tell you exactly i do think it just it's mostly from documents okay so just just kind of coincided with okay Mm -hmm. gotcha yeah Um, and that's fascinating that time period because it just doesn't feel that long ago right you know (laughs) um and so that was kind of a dip if you like imagine English as like it's growing and then all of a sudden it drops off. Like we don't get any written anything of the English language for two hundred years. Wait, when what period? What two hundred years are you talking about? So, well, okay, so I'm I'm kind of explaining like the overview of what just happened. Okay. So, ten sixty six, like, and once William has gained like control of England. Okay. At that point, the written English language is gone. Okay. Um, and it doesn't come back fully until the 1400s. Wow. And it's just, it's this beautiful, like, black hole that people, I feel like this is why it's one of the most fascinating things to me is because people have just had to look back and kind of see, like, what happened as a result of this period because wow. you can't really see it changing because it's yeah. not written down. It just, it, um, it's there. It disappears and comes back in a different form, of course. It's got to exactly. be altered. And that's why they call it the restoration. I get it. Okay, cool. Yes. So um, the effects on the English language specifically, um, the Normans, like I said, they weren't really that keen about it. Um, they spoke about, like, English. Um, they spoke French. And it was the written language aside from Latin, which was obviously a mainstay at this point in legal and religious matters. Maybe not obviously to other people. Um, just realized that people don't study language. <laughs> <laughs> may not, may not know. know that fact. But Latin is very much the language um, that's used for legal and religious matters. And especially after the Ho- Holy Roman Empire came and brought Christianity um, for that reason. But then also like just other like very like, collegiate things um, is where latin is used um but for the most part french is the written language um and so but even despite that 90 percent of the population of england still spoke english um wow it was yeah but they were they were like separated enough um and kind of you know confined to their own you know yeah bits and pieces let me just clarify so I make sure I understand what you're saying. So 90% of the population still spoke, spoke English. You're talking about the period between 1066 and the few hundred years later, during that dark period where there's yeah. nothing is written. That must yeah. mean that 10% approximately were nobility or in that upper realm, and 90% mm-hmm. were like the workers and the, yeah. I don't know if there was serfs back then or whatever, but um, right. Okay. Gosh. And they also, they also had, there were people like knights, Um, And stuff who, like, had, like, intermarriages with the English um, who weren't, like, as noble enough to, like, go travel to France to find a wife. Right. Um, And so, like, they would, they might be bilingual or, you know, they might understand French. Right. Or not French. I mean, understand English, but not speak it, you know. Definitely don't write it. Yeah. Gotcha. Definitely don't write it. Yeah. It was not something that people wrote down, um, except for, like, a couple of instances. So what's really interesting about writing um, is that it's entirely a way to conserve a language, and that's evident across the board um, with any like language that doesn't have a written form. It's going to have much more massive changes, um, right. dramatic changes, but also quick changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so with the advent of the French language and um, like with Latin also being introduced into the English society, in addition to the fact that it's not being written down, it's just like this time is completely raw with changes. And what's interesting, so the first 
king to have a good command over the English language um, wasn't until 1272. Okay. And so this was about 200 years after the invasion. Um, and I think it's important to note that that was the darkest period for the English language um, because, you know, at that point, he had a good command. He obviously he probably wasn't a native English speaker because that wasn't until much later, um, like 150 years later. But it is important to remember that um, it happens gradually. There's no like absolute, now we speak English. Right. <laughs> now we don't speak English. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's also important to know um, that even though Latin existed in England at this point, Latin was a lot more of a forced language. And interestingly, many Latinate words that we have in our vocabulary today come via French and not Latin itself. Even though Latin was used and is a learned thing, more of the words that we have that came from Latin have already dissolved. That's interesting. I'm, I'm still just kind of mulling over how you said it's a forced language, meaning people are forced to learn it and use it because that sort of uh, was the... I don't want to say commerce, but... I would, honestly, it wasn't that people were forced to learn it. It was that people forced themselves to learn it. Well, because that was the way, that was like, that was the highway, right? That was the way that... No? Not at all. Really? No, this is going into a whole nother spectrum that okay. I would gladly talk about it. Yeah. I don't have notes on it, but I know it because so I took both Latin people and thought, linguistics. People thought it was important to know it because they, it... It was like during the Enlightenment linked. period and okay. stuff, they, they really harped on the importance of Latin. They thought that Latin is the end-all, be-all. Latin is where you people who are smart, they know Latin. <laughs> However... Like Latin is the <laughs> highest form of language. Everything was compared to Latin. And so, like, they learned Latin and tried to, like, Latinize English, basically, Uh which is another reason we have so many Latinate words, because even despite, like, French, there's also just, they tried to bring Latin into English. And Uh one reason why people are so, like, how is English a Germanic language when we have so many similarities to, like, Spanish and French and stuff? And the reason is because... At its core, English is Germanic, but because they wanted to be so Latin, it changed things. So, hmm, wow, isn't yeah, yeah, I know it's so cool the way people do things wow. and it just changes language. Um, <laughs> so anyway, all of these things collected during this time, the the language just was just like English, the English language was wrought with changes in pronunciation and vocabulary alike. The period of darkness specifically between 1066 and like 1272, that time was, it resulted in changes of both like the quality and quantity of vowels. And we're going to talk just very slightly about this because I think it's important in language. I love pronunciation, but it's also really it can get so nuanced. Um, it and can, so, and, and like English is just notoriously horrible for uh, people to learn because the five vowels sound so different depending on where they are, yeah. what they're next to, and that sort of thing. But so. that's also the beauty of English, which we'll get to. I have, I have, because I love the English language so much, I literally hate it when people are like, this is difficult, this is impossible. I'm <laughs> like, okay, listen, it is, it is the beauty of the language. Okay, so the quality of a vowel is like where it's articulated in the mouth. And then the quantity of the vowel is how long it is. So most notable qualitative change that happened to the English language after the Norman invasion was called vowel reduction, which is like the centralizing and laxing of short vowels, um, which means that a lot of like ah became like uh. Huh. And uh, like it became uh okay. and stuff like that. Um, to the schwa sound, the schwa sounds like the uh yeah. sound. Yeah, that's, that's good. just like in the very middle of your mouth, and it's the most relaxed. It's the easiest sound, sound to make. make. It's <laughs> so easy, and like I'm sure a reason for that is because I mean it wasn't written. People were just it was colloquial. It was entirely co- colloquial, so they're it's gonna relax, you know. Uh-huh. Um. And uh, so that happened in many syllables that like didn't have the primary stress on them. And that's just the most notable of the qualitative changes. There's a lot more that happened. And then the quantitative changes could very well have been brought like by the large number of French words. And if you remember, this is like the length of the vowel. So the large number of French words and then the... Sorry, let me just ask you real quick. When you say the length of the vowel, you mean how long it's pronounced in the word, like for how long it endures when you're saying it? 
Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. I just wanted to make sure that's what, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, you don't think about that as much. <laughs> you don't realize that that's a factor. If that you we're don't saying, really know languages. Yeah. But like in the um, word freedom, for example, we have two E's there and freedom. It's not, it's, I'm stretching it out, obviously, but it's not freedom, you know, like. Yeah. It's not freedom. Yeah. It's freedom. Right. Yeah. Totally. And so, yeah, that was like very likely to have been brought about by the large number of French words and also the accentual pattern um, that the French brought um, and through those French words because their accents, they put the accent on the latter half of the word, whereas English puts the accent on the former half of the word. Hmm. And so it kind of changed things around a little bit. I have so many examples that I'm just absolutely enthralled by (laughs) but I'm not going to give them because that's too much so I think something that's a lot easier to see is the language the words rather than the parts of of the the words words. right Um, yeah so 42 percent of words borrowed from French are estimated to have been like solidified in the English language between 1250 and 1400 which was the greatest time of bilingualism it was kind of the transitionary between like French is the best. English is you idiots Secondary. over there. Um, you know. <laughs> and, so 42% of the words borrowed from the French. Can you say that statement over again? Yeah. So 42% of the words borrowed from French are estimated to have been solidified in the English okay. language between 1250 and 1400, okay. which is the time of the greatest bilingualism in England. And so like because French was the language of masters to servants and um, it was more of a signifier of status rather than ethnicity, um, you have a lot of different categories specifically of vocabulary. My favorite example is live animals versus prepared meat, Uh, which is funny to think about. I think you've probably heard me talk about this before because it's so fascinating to me. The live animals, the people who were keeping the live animals were English speakers. The people who were eating the meat that came from the live animals and the people who, like, when it was served to them, were French speakers. That's fascinating. So that's how we have the difference between ox or cow and beef or swine and pork or deer and venison, sheep and mutton, calf and veal. That's so cool. I had no idea why that might have been. Yeah, it's because... The the ones on the pork, venison, mutton, that's French. But you have like swine, deer, sheep, that's English. Fascinating. That's very I mean, cool. All English now, very you know, cool. But those are yeah. the ones that came from it. But that's yeah. how it, that's where it stemmed from. Mm-hmm. That's cool. I yeah. like that direct mm-hmm. connection to the culture. Right? Isn't that so interesting? We also have like vocabulary for government, military, law economic organization, art, architecture, music, literature, medicine, learning, fashion, food, furnishings, social life, non-nuclear families, and trades. All coming those, from? All coming from French. Wow. Th- those are like some major like domains of vocabulary. Um, and you can kind of see how that would make sense if you think about the way that society was set up and also like, you know, the influence that people who are higher up in society have in general yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting and then you also think about norman french versus central french because if you remember a large group of nobility came in in a second wave from france itself from, from paris the, right and they spoke central french and you see the difference in words that we get from Norman French and Central French because of the dialects. Mm-hmm. So words from Central French um, have more of uh, the Latin. Um, this is, so as many people know, French is a romantic language, so it comes from Latin. The Latin K sound before an A in Norman French kept being K, but in Central French, it developed a CH sound. Huh. So we have words from Norman French like carry or carry on or like carry in, you know, like a carrying bird or like carpenter, carriage, stuff like that. But in central French, we have charity, chair, charge, chariot, stuff like that. Hmm. And then also with the Latin w sound, stayed w in normal, Norman French, but it went to g in central French. So we have words like garment, garrison, and garland from Central French, but waste, worn, and wicket from Norman French. Wow. And I'm just like absolutely like 
enthralled. I love it because those are completely different dialects and they came to our our vocabulary in different dialects. And because English doesn't, you know, it's not French. So it's not going to have one or the other. Yeah. It's going to take both. Yeah. So it absorbed it. English, they're different. Right. You know, right. those are completely different. And that's very also similar to how like words that we borrowed from French way back then and words that modern English has borrowed from French. Um, Cause you'll see like the change in how the sounds are um, or like where we put our emphasis on vowels. So, cause like we have, Earlier borrowings are words like champion and gentle, but like later borrowings are words like chandelier and genre Uh and like the the way the CH or the G like make different like ch or sh and j or j. And um, then we also have where we place the emphasis. So like because over time our words that are integrated into English are going to end up having the early accent in the word. Like I mentioned before, how English uh-huh. likes to put the accent on the first vowel. So we have early borrowings in English versus later borrowings um, that like moral versus morale. And uh. Uh, yeah, and like gentle versus genteel, things like that. Um, then we also see that words initially that came into Middle English, English like pilgrimage, you speak pilgrimage probably, or or however you pronounce that pilgrimage. I don't know, uh, <laughs> but it's like the the emphasis was on, later on on the a, right? Which is so interesting. But anyway, so that those are a lot of different ways that English changed, and I mean there are so many different changes in the English language in general. But because it was completely wiped out of a language of power, it wasn't used for writing. It was being charged with an influx of French words and like French accents and French culture, it's it really was such a huge change, the Norman invasion. And I really think it speaks to like the resilience of, of people and of language that they were able to like maintain this and kind of come out the other end in a way that it really proves that English can take a battering from anything. It's like like Kirby. Like any language that like English sucks up and like it's able to kind of just integrate those words. And I think that really speaks to how it's been able to become a world language. Um, Just, you know, obviously like globalization, colonization, stuff like that have played a major impact as well, um, as well as the Internet. But I think that the way that English works and that it can take vocabulary from other languages and just kind of eat it absorb up. yeah yeah i think that really speaks to how it, it can be taken on by so many other people who speak other languages and i also think it's really so fun to think of how like our lives and our everyday speech can affect something so much grander and like we're always in the po- process of evolving our language like yeah. these people at this time who were speaking english and like working in the fields they didn't know that like <laughs> the things that they were saying would eventually become like what we're saying today yeah yeah that it would carry on and people would find it interesting oh these were the guys that were saying yeah you know pig or whatever (laughs) that's fascinating so cool I love your passion on the topic and I feel like I have been sitting in a class at a university somewhere (laughs) so it's been a lot of fun yeah, I did get a lot of it from my my textbook, um, but uh, most of the the like language stuff was from my textbook, but the rest of it was from like BBC and and stuff like it's that. It's so. very, it's just so very cool, and, and it's so much. I mean, you packed in so much history in there that just it's so easy just to focus on kind of the here and now, or even the past. You know, the period of our own lives that. Or just for us Americans, like the recognizable history, you know, the past couple hundred years you know, yeah. after that. But when you get into, you start off at a thousand, it's like, oh boy, you know, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Dig deep because this is going to take some thinking. It really just gives you like a whole, uh, it, it pushed me outside of my typical perspective. And um, it's just really fascinating um, to hear, to hear all that again and hear how it all kind of played out. Kind of a very broad, you know, overview, but that was really awesome. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it. I think it is difficult to explain stuff that takes place over a lot of 
time, I did mostly just want to give like backstory as to why the Normans invaded and just kind of to show that this wasn't just a happenstance and then English change, you know, like yeah. these are things that were, were constantly evolving and it's like little explosions that affect other things. All played and a part. Exactly. The biggest thing that I actually learned, it wasn't sort of like, oh yeah, I remember hearing something, you know, was the fact that uh, English wasn't written for a while. Like it became almost... I don't want to say non-existent because it was still being spoken, obviously, but as far as being able to go find something that was written in English in 1150 or whatever, you know, like yeah. that you're not going to find it. That's kind of the was the most eye-opening thing that um, it teetered kind of, you know, on the edge there for a while before it kind of came back officially. And I didn't realize that that had been the case. So because, you know, when you think of people from England and you think that they've got they're all proper and not obviously not everybody because there's there's still different dialects and all that, but certain um, accents in England, at least from my perspective, seem to be associated with higher upper class or whatever, you know. So just to hear that where it came from is really fascinating. So the reason you think of, the, of it as the higher class is because it's the Queen's English, um, which is London English and also actually the most most related to southern english like of the south, south of US, US, english. us i've heard that before yeah. yes and so but that's also the english that the angles brought oh. specifically oh. so like the regions of accent in england and you know henceforth in the u.s actually came from the germanic tribes and where they settled wow is that not one of the most fascinating things? It is. It's so, so cool. It makes me want to throw on a backpack and just go walking through England just to hear people talk. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> well, Julia, I'm really glad yeah, you liked it. <laughs> I did. I, you did a fantastic job. I knew that you would. And thank you for bringing us um, information on such an intellectual topic it feels very intellectual so um is entertaining and educational i appreciate it i know that um you know your time is valuable so thank you so much for joining us here on history slices podcast and this is usually where we say what's coming up next time and you probably have no idea but i do know no. that um, <laughs> um the next episode is going to be recorded by jacob and i so um i don't know what the topic is i just know that we're going to be back to our original host again next time so um we'll see what happens after that but uh, Jules, thanks again. Audience, we appreciate you immensely. Thanks for putting up with yeah. us. and uh, Thanks for listening to my rambling about the English language and language in general, because I will talk to anybody with an ear about that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there's like a place I wanted to say, and where can people go if they want to know more? But, you know, like, what are you going to say? Go to the internet, Google. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the English language of linguistic history. That's the textbook that I read. And it's so comprehensive. You don't really need a background in linguistics to learn about it um, because it's, I mean, I remember starting this class and we were talking about things I'd already learned in other linguistics classes. So it's all very like understandable. It, you know, eats away slowly and it's obviously very intellectual, but there's also like exercises in it to try and like remember things from the chapters. And right. so if for some reason you're like, wow, this is so cool. I would buy that textbook. Um, it's, <laughs> it's an Oxford published book. It's just, it's wonderful. So I would, if only we had three lives to live and we could, you know, dive into everything that we interested us. That'd be cool. Right. Very cool. Okay, Jules. Thank you. And until next time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mama. <laughs> Bye. Confucius once said, study the past if you would define the future. You've been listening to the History Slices podcast with Jacob and Rachel. We hope you've gotten some useful information from the show. We hope we made you think, and we hope you were entertained. We know we had fun. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on Facebook at History Slices and on Instagram at History Slices Podcast. Make sure to like, rate, and review the show. And tell a friend about the show. That'll help us out, too. One more quote before we go from Michael Crichton. If you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know it's part of a tree. Till next time, this is History Slices, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.